I had no idea about this whole world. I mean, how would these design look like? How, how does a temple of in 1250 look like, or the city of Troy? You know, a lot of this, though, was, was what the production design people came up with, and they had to combine research with imagination. It is a heroic story, and so the whole setting is glamorized. You're watching an epic film, and you've got to have these epic proportions in order to make this such a grand film. You have your moments on these productions where it, you get overwhelmed by the, by the art direction and by the set design. The huge gates open, and all these people are cheering, and they're throwing petals at us. I mean, I had goosebumps. It's just one of these things. You, you really think you're there. Heinrich Schliemann is a German explorer who excavated uh, Troy in the 19th century. He says that when he was eight years old, he was given a book, a children's history, which showed the burning city of Troy and Aeneas escaping from it. And his father explained to him that it was an artist's reconstruction. Nobody really knew anything about Troy. And, and Schliemann tells us in his own autobiography, at that moment I said to my father, when I'm grown up, I'm going to go and find Troy. He almost literally set off with Homer in one hand and a spade in the other to prove that the world of Homer had existed. Schliemann began excavating at the site that we now call Troy. And he said to the world, yes, this is it. I have found the Troy of the Trojan War, where Priam lived, where the heroes came and fought. With a project like this, you've got to do a lot of research. It was important for Wolfgang that the film was authentic, as authentic as possible. Nigel Phelps had an enormous knowledge about the time, and his, his first drawings were just beautiful. And they were digging themselves into all kinds of books and research material and British Museum. I was just fascinated by they, what they came up with. Nigel Phelps is... Uh, view on it was that he'd rather create something of, of tremendous visual interest rather than you can actually get slightly bogged down with um, historical research and things like that. You look at pictures of what, what contemporary historians think Troy probably looked like and it's quite a bit smaller than what we have and quite a bit less majestic. But for the movie, it's, it, it makes it more powerful and, it, and frankly it makes it more beautiful that you have this glorious city. I realized that the reality of the period was that the buildings and everything is very small. And so what I've done is mix up several different cultures of the period, the scale of the Egyptians and some of the forms that the Mycenaeans created. But to get the big landscapes, the big epic sweeps, and you figure out where, where in the world are you going to be doing this. We started the construction process for Troy in Malta, in the middle of the Mediterranean. Uh, a film like Troy, being an historical project, uh, you can't get anything. You can't get props, you can't get furniture, uh, nothing exists. So absolutely everything you see on the screen has to be designed, budgeted, created, argued over. So here we are behind the streets, behind the back lot. And if we go through here, we'll get a good view of the square. We exaggerated the, the scale of the city and, you know, an example of where this historical accuracy then goes out the window is that you know the largest sculpture that was found over that period was 10 feet tall you know and we've got to have like 40 foot statues we had to create our own language with the art of the place we were um, combining all these different sort of cultural references the world that we have in troy you know a more religious place as opposed to the spartan and the mycenaean cultures which they don't have any art they don't have any sculptures we had over 115 columns there was probably 20 different types, the largest of which were 40 feet high, and probably the smallest were about 15 foot high. The set really, apart from structure, columns, and, and uh, you know, geometrical lines, was, was very much about texture. We used a lot of real surfaces which existed in Malta that we, we took rubber molds from. 
in between scenes you might be doing something like changing your shoelace and you look down and you think no one will ever see that grouting but someone's actually paid attention to that and the amount of effort and detail that goes into it it's um you kind of feel a bit guilty most sets that i've been on things will look good from about 10 feet away which means they'll look okay on camera but when you get up close you can see that it's you know that's fiberglass i mean i would be standing right next to it and looking at these blocks of stone and they, they still look completely real it was completely fascinating walking onto the set of Troy in Malta and seeing what in my archaeological way I think of as Troy 6, which is the way the archaeologists refer to the Troy of the Late Bronze Age, before my eyes. We were initially going to go to Morocco for the, the scale parts of the film, meaning we needed to have a very broad beach where a thousand ships could land. We had to make the decision right when there was the potential for the Iraq conflict. And then because of the political situation and the danger to go to Morocco, the only real alternate situation we found was Mexico on the other side of the world. Fortunately, I had a coffee table book on Baja and there was a, an aerial picture of these, this fantastic looking beach. Because it felt as if it were a beach that hadn't really been touched. Progress really hasn't come yet, or civilization to that extent. I mean, it was really stunning and in many ways much, much better for telling our story in the sense that it looks much more like the Aegean. I mean, there were two issues. One, the environmental issues. I mean, first of all, we're working on what is pretty much a pristine beach. The uh, entire coast of Mexico is an endangered turtle habitat. So to allow us to, to build our boats on the beach, to have our encampments, to occupy such a large stretch of beach, we implemented our own turtle incubation nursery. We've been able to um, release more baby turtles into the ocean because of you know, the precautions that we've taken. Because of the rush with the change from uh, Morocco to Mexico, um, there really wasn't enough time spent on just finding out exactly what happens to that beach. It was never the same beach on any particular given day, really. I, it changed all the time. Early one morning, to so, like get down to the beach straight away, and two of the ships were like teetering on the edge of this like 10 foot bank of sand. It was just like 100 foot of the beach had washed away overnight. Logistically, a nightmare, but as a location, you know, it was, it was fantastic. We've built 500 foot of wall, and for the most part, it's on average 40 foot tall. It's 60 feet in the central bit where we have the 40 foot gates. It's endless, and Wolfgang would have to sit down and say, this is what you'll see. Digitally, it's going to be extended by miles. As a viewer, we should have the same reaction as Helen does when she first sees it. You know, she's looking around, you should be filled in awe. Actually, there have been challenges with weather everywhere. And it seems just when we sort of get a, a foot up or a leg up, so to speak, something happens like the, the hurricane in Mexico. We just wrapped first unit Friday night, did some inserts on Saturday, and we were just about to shoot an additional week of second unit um, when Hurricane Marty blew through uh, the Baja Peninsula and pretty much hit Cabo San Lucas directly. You can see the devastation all around you. It worked out that the, the cheapest way of doing all of the, you know, these other three days of shooting that needed to happen was to rebuild the whole thing again. The horse was a really pivotal uh, design challenge in the film. I think it's 12 days the Greeks had to build it. If you apply logic to it, the only building material the Greeks would have had would have been burnt ships and the vestiges of the Trojan defences that were left behind. Bob Ringwood came in with a very uh, intriguing reference of a gorilla um, that had been made 
out of car tires. I also had a picture of this decomposed ship. It just burnt and charred and it just looked fantastic. And it was pretty simple to look at the two things. It was like, hmm. But Paul Catlin came up with what was the best one. And the sculptor, Martin Smeaton, took the sketch and came up with a like a 12-inch maquette that was just fantastic. And then we embarked on making a full-size sculpt in polystyrene. It's 42 feet high. And the other thing with having this sort of informal design was that you could have lots of different doors that would open in it. The whole thing weighs about now 12 tonnes. One of the driving factors was the fact that it had to be dismantleable to transport from England to Malta and then take it apart again and then from Malta to Mexico. At about the time when the Greek tradition felt the Trojan War had happened, there does seem to be a stage of the city of Troy that was attacked and was destroyed by enemy action. So there is the possibility that that is the single event that was behind the Greek tradition of the war. Equally, there's a the possibility that there was more than one Trojan War. In a society where they built everything out of stone, you know, how do you burn the city? We had to integrate a lot of wooden aspects, as many wooden aspects as we could, into the design. So we've got a lot of market stalls and um, wooden scaffolding and awnings and lean-tos. So far as an exterior purpose-rigged fire job for a movie is concerned, I, I personally can't think of anything bigger, perhaps since Gone with the Wind. Hopefully ours will be slightly different to that because this will be controlled and we can turn it off. You move to the side walls, all the three sides there, away from the horse and away from this building here. We have five separate points throughout the back of the set where we have a liquid propane gas tanks. We get a little bit jittery when we see people, you know, having a quiet cigarette leaning on a 500 litre propane tank. Wolfgang rolled the shot for two, three minutes, then it was cut, and the Maltese firemen ran in onto the set and doused the door down. I mean, it was absolutely breathtaking, that the way the horse caught. Bernard Shaw said, no one has satisfactorily placed a boundary between myth and history. So you can see the enormous attractions, both of the story, the historical story, plus the myth. Doing a movie on this, this scale with these uh, thousands of people, with these uh, sets that were almost unheard of, to shoot that in Malta, in Mexico afterwards, and you pull it off because of one reason, you have a fantastic project. In a movie like Troy, it is sort of particularly difficult to achieve 70,000 people fighting in front of a city that doesn't actually exist, and to have a thousand ships land when you only have two practically built. They don't make these movies anymore, and to see, okay, we do it, and we do it well. We try to fill the frame as much as possible with real action, with real people really fighting, and with real boats. We can actually show a thousand ships, and we can show armies of 75,000 soldiers. This ought to be on screen. Wherever the limitations of the reality stop, that's where we try and take over. Starting from the beginning, one of the biggest ones was obviously creating an armada. You know, we knew we had to create a thousand ships, you know, sailing on their way and then landing on the beaches of Troy. Right from the get-go, we took the plans from the art department and replicated the two ships that they were building and 
five or six other variations of those types of boats. We built them in CG. We had to build CG armies to row them. And we tried to keep our canvas real. The ocean was always the real ocean. We then just composited our ships into it. We sort of created a tracking system that enabled us to lay floating buoys and different uh, scales of boat out in the ocean so that we could figure out all of our scaling and tracking because tracking from a, a moving camera on a moving platform on a moving ocean is quite complicated. But we did a lot of testing on that and, and created some software that enabled us to, to really get some great tracks from that. And then we were able to build a thousand ships and uh, composite those into the, into the sequence. We had the feeling when we, we, when we did that shot and we were working on it that there were too many boats in there. Everybody at the house, all of us were said, this is too many. There actually aren't too many. There are under a thousand ships in that shot. But the reality is, as I was explained to Wolfgang afterwards, is that to have a thousand boats in that kind of a sea, it's just not possible. Even though there were a thousand ships, they would be spread out over miles and miles of ocean. They're sailing too close to each other. They're, they're taking each other's wind. So we went back in there and we sort of tried to persuade Wolfgang to say, let us strip 60% of them out, which we've subsequently done. And it does look a lot better. Even just having three or 400 ships is still, you know, looks incredible on a shot like that. The cable cam shots were by far the most difficult, of which there's several in the film. In sort of simplistic terms, it's putting up uh, cranes or stanchions that can go up to several hundred feet in the air that has a wire connected between the two cranes and underneath it is slung a chassis system with a camera mounted underneath that. And that enables the camera, which is on a trolley connected to the cables above, to travel at high speeds for as long as the cables are. Basically, it started off life as a, as a wire cam shot that uh, Simon Crane, the second union director, wanted to do in Malta, which was to basically chase over from the wall, come down, seeing all of the Greeks storming through the city and follow them right the way down through the set. And then we just sort of came up with this idea and said, well, if you shot it this way, we could later on, we could marry this together with a wire cam shot that we were already planning to do in Mexico, which was to follow 50,000 Greeks as they appeared in, through the darkness and then maybe we could actually just tie the two together. So we basically devised the shot so that there was a, we had the ability to basically just split the two plates together. And it was very simple just to literally eyeball the speed of it until the two cameras were traveling at the same speed. We knew the height of the rig, the lens and the angle it was pointed at. It was actually quite a simple split between the two locations. The first thing when I read the script was, you know, going through all these battle sequences and they just say that there's thousands and thousands of people and I was just thinking, how on God's earth are we going to make this look believable? One of the biggest challenges and problems that we had to overcome was the fact that we had to create armies of 50, 70,000. So it's not the same as all the battles we've seen come before us, so it was just trying to see how we were going to take battles one step further. Immediately what they had to do was to write uh, some software that would enable us to create uh, an artificial intelligence system that could control and manage all of these soldiers. The software enabled us to basically go onto a motion capture stage and motion capture real stunt performers performing different actions from walking to running to fighting, fighting with swords fighting with shield, crashing into each other, running uphill, running downhill. And then the software basically is able to blend all of those motion capture clips together and it can do it within a few frames. And therefore your 50,000 people are always individually different from each other because variation is the name of the game when you have 50,000 people so that you don't end up getting repetition and replication because unfortunately that is what the eye immediately seeks out and finds. We were also able to give each of the soldiers different values of aggression and this enabled us to say well who was going to win and who was going to lose and then you literally let the computer go and it creates what we call a sim, a simulation of the action and the computer will select all the motion capture clips that it thinks are relevant for the next step and the next motion that that character should be doing and it's like a sort of a virtual chess. The, 
The Battle of the Arrows was a sequence that Wolfgang wanted to start off in a very epic manner. He wanted to see the fact that we had 20,000 Trojan troops outside the walls of Troy, and then he wanted to see 50,000 Greek troops march up and square off against them. And then this great fight start while the Trojans rain down arrows and slaughter the Greeks, and then everybody retreats and runs away. Yeah, 50,000 Greeks attacking 25,000 Greeks, and it might have taken me 12 seconds to write that. And then you see it on screen, and it's remarkable how much work it took to do that. We worked with Wolfgang and with the DP uh, a lot in uh, pre-production using pre-visualization tools and a little virtual army software that, that we created that enabled us to actually march armies up together and move the camera around and find the best shots that we were able to. That also enabled us to make sure we had the right equipment out on the location. It's exciting to create these worlds first in computers and then you see it more and more realized and finally you see the, the final product. Sound is often uh, misunderstood by the general public. They assume that the material that's recorded during the production becomes the material that comprises the final soundtrack. The job of the sound editor is to sort of simulate the reality of, of a photograph. You're trying to present a sonic reality that may have nothing to do with, uh, with anything that visually would, would ring true. This is a Foley stage. It's the product of 10 years of dumpster diving, garage sale hunting, and the collecting of various materials that we might use to do sound design and to create sound effects for films. In the Battle of the Barricades, we had these large hay balls that were set ablaze, and they would come rolling down the hill into the Greek camp. What we wanted to do was create a base element so that we could give some size and some weight to these hay balls. Add to them some other crunchy sounds to create the sound for the large fireballs. The sound of arrows flying through the air needed to be captured in great number, and therefore we needed a very large variety of whooshes and swooshes and flying sounds. Here's a wiffle ball bat. Four or five sounds to make a single arrow flight sound. That then single arrow flight sound was composited a thousand times in order to make a cloud of arrows appear from the walls of the city. Expressing the sound of swords was an essential element in Troy. Sword play basically comes in two flavors sonically. There's the clank of the metal on metal. And there's the sort of the scrape and the zhing sound as we call it for the metal being uh, glanced. Fire, like everything else, uh, can fool the microphone. Proximity with fire is just like proximity with, with any sound. The closer you get to the microphone, the larger the fire sounds. And so a small fire close to a microphone can sound like a much greater fire. The most interesting challenge in Troy was to give it this big scope and big scale and to express that throughout the film. My first thing when I read the script was 
Oh Christ, how are we going to do that? Simon Crane, he was instrumental in getting uh, these, these, what I think, amazingly choreographed battles together. The work they've done in those battle scenes is just unbelievable. The story is a love story, but above all, it's a war. They fought with spears, they fought with swords. It was brutal, brutal, brutal. When you're reading about what weapons they had and what horrific injuries they suffered, it was really key to keep it all real. The main instruments of war were spear and shield. Most actors and stuntmen want to work with just swords. The stunt arrangers had a kind of challenge there, trying to get the stuntmen and actors to work more with spears. We had silicon heads of dummies that we were taking spears right through from one side to the other. The Iliad describes Hector's lance as being five and a half metres long. Well, you just, you know, we made one just to prove the point and you couldn't work with it. So you keep bringing it down till you can get a length that you think, well, this functions. Every time we make something, we all go out into the yard and fight each other to see if it works. We've made this so Brad can have the shield in his hand, do a tracking shot behind him, see in the distance the uh, Boagris character throw or mime to throw the spears, visual effects would CG the movement of the spears, and we would have the tips come through the shield. One there, and one there as close to Brad as he likes. Not everyone had swords, and when they did fight, they were often made of bronze, so they would often bend. So in the film, we were actually using rubber swords, and some of them did bend, but that was very realistic. And knowing that the swords are made from bronze, they're gonna do more damage in a particular way. So that's the way we created the effects to do more damage in a, maybe in a crushing um, of limbs, manner rather than a cutting like a samurai sword would be extremely extremely sharp so even if you don't cut somebody and you hit them across the the arm you're going to break that bone if anyone hits someone else with one of these i mean it wouldn't kill them outright but you know if they if they cut themselves badly enough it would lead ultimately to their death it, it must have been a very very brutal horrible slow way to die <laughs> They used to, you know, fire arrows. You know, it's the, it the bow and arrow. Background, ready, and action. One, if people got arrows in them, it wouldn't kill them. They'd fall down, maybe. But you don't die straight away. One of the problems with arrows is that they weigh. And so you can put them into a prosthetic, and they want them pointing out, and they drop. So we made the arrows out of paper. We fired them out of air cannons that were specially made, so we could fire ten arrows at a time. The amount of um, gore, blood and, and decapitation sticking of swords in people was, was uh, quite extreme. Uh, my edict from Wolfgang right at the beginning was, you know, as much as much as possible. The violence in the story is particularly necessary because it's, it's a reflection of the world they were in. We weren't trying to glorify it, we were just trying to show realistic action. One group is on one side, another group is on the other side. They're armed with spears and a few shields and they run together. What do you think happens? It's going to be very, very gory. My job is to uh, prepare the soldiers uh, for their roles as uh, Trojan or Greek warriors. We've got about 800 soldiers. 300 of them are Bulgarians, which we brought from Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, and the other 500 are Mexicans. The backside of that pen are four flags. There isn't a figure on them, but it's A, B, C, and D. Ahorita no tienen los letreros, las banderas que ven allá atrás hechas de maderas, pero es A, B, C y D. A eso de atrás le llamamos corral.
We've had about uh, three weeks uh, to prepare these guys uh, to be fully trained soldiers. They've started without any kind of weapons at all, and then after about a week they've gone to using weapons. And then after that, in the third week, we actually take them down onto the set and start trying to get into the format that they will actually be using. Treat these as real spears. They're dangerous. And then a recoil. And then over the top. Attention! Good. Excellent. One more time, this time more aggressive, stronger with the spears. And if you're getting killed, you gotta fall down and die. All right? Много агресия в началото. Много агресия в началото. Като каже ready да има а kill him then go again. Kill him more, yeah? Open up the shield a little bit more so that there's there's something for him to hit. Do not get too close. Yeah, to each other. Sometimes when you get too close, you know, remember you got a spear in your hand. So always try and keep the distance. Yeah. If you guys quit concentrating for two seconds, the whole day is fucked up. So it's got to be very serious. Right? When you action, everybody goes. And everybody's on the same page. Angry, angry. Action! Action! It's just a bit not 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 acting it very well. It's not too easy. So it's a life and death situation. It's you or him, yeah. So you have to be really aggressive as if it's your last move, yeah. Prepare to march. 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 Prepare to turn to the left. Turn. Prepare for battle. Move back. To a position of, of, of um, so you got some space, battle positions there, and then charge on this. Most of the, the Mexican scenes that we're shooting here are huge battle scenes where we have two enormous armies coming together in a, a, like a car crash together. And that has to be done with a great deal of control. Good, good, good. Good, guys. Good, 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 good. Any epic film like Troy is going to be difficult, but this was extremely difficult just because of the numbers of people. The locations where we were, in the, it, they were extremely hot and the costumes that people were wearing. The vision of it all is, it's harsh sunlight and you fight with your armor and you're sweating and uh, it, you feel that it's painful. That's what uh, Hector says to Paris. He says, if you see men dying, I have. It's nothing glorious about it. And our battles are not glorious. You know, we were working six days a week. There were two units shooting at the same time. Six days a week takes its toll, especially, you know, filming for five months. We're gonna keep doing the same as yesterday. There's gonna be some fireballs thrown by to the Greek encampment. So you're gonna keep moving all the time until you listen God. We had one there that sort of went bouncy, bouncy. Right. It just looked different. Yeah. And you know, and then that fills this whole frame mm -hmm. the rest is vision effect. So nobody runs straight to the balls. Everybody runs away of the balls and then you find another one on your way. Avoid that one, near misses. Okay, that's it, guys. So get ready and we do a rehearsal when we can. Is everybody ready? Rehearsing. Everybody set. Back on action! And one, two, three, four, five! Okay, cut it. Okay, here we go. Yeah, go on, mate. Back on working on a beach at night with those sort of inclines in sand for three months. And then at night, this whole other element kicked in of 
the creepy crawlies. Everyone's sort of keeping near the lights. I remember standing there one night, I was standing next to the camera and I've looked down at the operator's leg and he hasn't noticed, but he's got a spider on his boot being eaten by a scorpion. So I was like, oh my God, have a look, have a look. You know, so there was all those elements. It was very physically hard, it was a hard shoot. We did a lot of training with the actors, you know, especially Eric Banner and Brad Pitt, in that they had a lot of fighting to do. And, you know, there's one main fight between the two of them. We were just a week before finishing this movie. We had just the big fight between Hector and Achilles left. We want to do it at the very end so that all the other big scenes are out of the way. We can completely concentrate now on the physical part. So no character work anymore for the actors. And right when we were ready to do that, a hurricane came and destroyed almost all of the wall of Troy with the gate and everything an unbelievable huge set uh, and the fight had to take place right in front of this uh, wall and we decided there's no other way than rebuilding the whole set again that took weeks and weeks of course hurricane came in wiped out the wall of troy plus i got injured that weekend so it was just not gonna happen brad funnily enough tweaked his achilles tendon and with what he does in his fights he does lots of jumps and lots of running and uh, obviously if he can't walk, he can't really do it. And uh, the doctor told him, you cannot work for, for weeks and weeks. I think we finished production sometime in, in September or so. Finally, finally, Brad was ready to do this fight uh, in the mid of December. And uh, it worked. Well, in Shakespeare's terms, it's sort of the death of kings. It's the big moment. This is the monumental fight. Action. Even if we saw 50,000 already against 25,000, this between these two is the most spectacular and the most fascinating and frightening of them all. You see absolute rage versus someone of absolute respect. I've seen this moment in my dreams. The Hector character represents equality. He is under attack from someone who has pinned all his life's frustrations and anger on this one man, and he's going to make him pay. He's going to destroy him. There are no pacts between lions and men. The thing that's most exciting about it is it's the actors doing it. I mean, and that's true of all the fights in this. It's the revelation of character through the fight, through the situation, rather than it being just a sort of a spectacle of moves. The fight scenes themselves, I know they spent months and months and months choreographing them, and we obviously spent a lot of time actually learning them, but I think the hardest part is, is the work that they put into creating them, because they needed to choreograph fights that not only look spectacular and that work, but that actors can do. X final one takes six. Okay. And action. <laughs> When you read the script and it says, oh, Achilles fights in a godlike manner, you think, oh, that's very easy to write, thank you very much. And now you've got to come up with a totally new sort of style of fighting. But I looked at all different styles of fighting. At that time, I was working with Thai stunt people, so I got them to prepare a fight, so I looked at that. That obviously wasn't what we wanted, but there was bits in it that were good. We used uh, Speed Skater as an image, um, Carl Lewis, the sprinter and long jumper, because in one of the first fights, he just moves and moves really quickly and with a great economy of action. It's not martial arts and it's not, not Matrix or Hong Kong Fury at all, but we sort of used a bit of that just in his body reaction, say. He's always trying to lunge with the sword, but he uses it like a boxer in that he feints maybe with one hand while he brings in like an uppercut with the sword. And he'd always try and get in over the top of the other person's shield to try and bring the sword through the back of the neck. It was a real, you know, Achilles showcase to show off his style of fighting. And Hector also show that he's totally skillful as well. Action. Hector has pretty much the most fights of anybody in the movie. Rather than having 
something like Achilles, which is very stylistic, his skills have been learnt through fighting. I like the fighting in this film because it's quite brutal and it's not like a martial art. There isn't an exact place to hit someone. But everything's a kill shot. Just know everything is a kill shot. <laughs> Got it. The worst nightmare for any sort of fight choreography is somebody getting hurt. Oh, shit. Got it. Pretty much all fight choreographers will avoid doing any attacks directly to the face. So nothing in the 8x10 or the headshot because you're going to change somebody's career. Obviously we work with blunt weapons, but I mean, they would still hurt if they hit you. Eric got hit, he got a bloody nose. Once, which looked, it was good because it was the end, end of the fight. Not, not, it wasn't good. No injury is good, but it was actually in character or in keeping with continuity. Essentially, you learn that you can never train too much because ultimately the shoots are very long, and to get through it mentally and physically, you, you do need to be to be fit. There's just no shade, and the sun is so intense, and then it's reflected off the ground as well because it's all the stone. And then, and there were days when I would see 200-pound like, grips just do a header, you <laughs> know, it was not uncommon. If you see the fight, you just can't believe that these are actors who are doing it. They're not stunt men hiding somewhere and they do it for the actors, it's the actors. They can be very proud of it and I am too for them. And if you talk about blood, sweat and tears, about the reality of a fight, that's one. Welcome to the Gallery of the Gods. Here you will meet the deities who in ancient belief shaped the destinies of men and determined the fate of Troy. These 12 gods and goddesses have influenced civilization throughout the ages and still hold sway over the human imagination today. Now, here are their tales. Ruthless and murderous, the god of war, Ares, with his passion for destruction, embodies in his legend the worst of humanity's traits. It is said that as he and his consorts, grief, strife, panic and terror, walk the earth in search of devastation and brutality, that a chorus of groans echoes to the heavens. During the Trojan War, he used his power to aid the Trojan warrior, Hector. But Ares himself was no hero. Rather, a coward who is described as fleeing the battlefield when wounded, his cries heard even on Mount Olympus. Today, centuries after the fall of Troy, Ares still casts his shadow across the world. His appetite for chaos and pain echoed throughout the ages. On Mount Olympus, where all other gods are beautiful, only Hephaestus, god of fire, is described as ugly. Legend has it that during a quarrel, Zeus hurled him down to earth, crippling him forever. But what he lacks in appearance, he makes up for in his extraordinary powers, and despite his deformity, or perhaps because of it, he crafted objects of exquisite beauty. From his workshop deep within the earth, this master of fire and forge crafted the palaces, tools, and armor of the gods and goddesses, such as Zeus's thunderbolt and Athena's armor. In the Trojan War, he fashioned, among other things, new armor for Achilles. And yet, his true value proved not in war, but in peace, as he was also the patron god of artists and craftsmen. The benevolent Hephaestus has bestowed gifts of great beauty and skill on humanity. His gentle character visible in the details of man's great artistic designs and achievements.
The only god who was said to have a mortal parent was Dionysus, the god of wine and the grape. His magical gift distilled from the vines was the bringer of both ecstasy and madness. His intoxicating creation can kindle revelry in his drinkers and also ignite drunken chaos. In ancient times, his worshippers would gather in the forest and dance in his honor, drinking until they reached a primal frenzy. The warriors of Troy sought relief from the fury in his potent brew. Indeed, this is true for war throughout the ages. But Dionysus was also known as the god of the theater, and some of the world's greatest ancient poetry was written for him. And all those who participated, from the writer to the actors and singers, were thought to be his servants. So next time you have a glass of wine, raise your cup to Dionysus, but never forget that it is a fine line between blessing and ruin when it comes to the power of the vine. Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty. Irresistible Aphrodite seduced God and mortal alike with her hypnotic beauty. Some claim that she was born of Zeus, others that she rose from the foam of the sea fully formed and devastatingly attractive. So breathtaking was her loveliness, she was envied by all the other goddesses on Mount Olympus. It was said that Paris judged her to be the most beautiful of all the goddesses and awarded her with the golden apple. To reward Paris, Aphrodite granted him Helen, the most beautiful woman on earth. But his deed invoked the wrath of Menelaus, king of Sparta, thus setting the wheels of the Trojan War in motion. Aphrodite sided with the Trojans and after their defeat, used her powers to protect her mortal son Aeneas, a Trojan warrior. It was said that with her enchanting laughter and unrivaled beauty, she could seduce any god or man she so desired. And in a love triangle, she married Hephaestus, Mount Olympus's homeliest of gods, while carrying on an affair with Ares, the most brutal. Aphrodite, sensual, mysterious, this original femme fatale has served as a familiar archetype throughout the ages. Apollo, god of prophecy, music, and healing, offers his wisdom as a link between gods and man alike. With an intellect as far-reaching as the arrows shot from a silver bow, he is said to be the first god to teach mortals the healing arts, including that of music. It was thought that he helped humans to achieve their full potential with his gifts of enlightenment. During the Trojan War, it was believed that Apollo sided with and aided the Trojan warrior Hector on the field of battle. As the conflict raged, he was said to have shot fiery arrows down at the Greeks from his chariot in the sky. Centuries later, when man journeyed to the heavens, they fittingly named their mission to the moon Apollo, after the god who inspired mankind to reach for the stars. Artemis, goddess of the hunt. As wild as nature itself, Artemis, the chaste goddess of the hunt and protector of the young, serenely ruled over the Earth's untamed places. Twin sister of Apollo, her archery skills surpassed that of all the gods on Mount Olympus. 
She's never without her silver bow and arrows. She sided with the Trojans during the war, and it was said that when a hare and its young were slain by the Greeks, Artemis unleashed fierce northern winds that prevented them from setting sail for Troy. Only when the Greeks had sacrificed King Agamemnon's eldest daughter to Artemis did the winds relent. Today, the legacy of Artemis can be seen in women who have defied convention and taken a more individual and liberated route in life. A phantom in the moonlight, she is said to still inhabit the forest. Demeter, the goddess of agriculture and fertility, was thought to have first taught mortals how to work the land and reap its harvest. Endowed with the power to bring feast and famine to the world, she is said to have the ability to control the seasons and transform the face of nature. Today, peaceful farmland flourishes on the very soil where it is believed the Trojan War was fought. Proof, perhaps, of the healing power of Demeter to bring forth new life, even at this legendary site of epic violence. With water covering over 70% of the world's surface, it is only natural that a god should be appointed the duty of ruling over it and all its wonders. Poseidon serves as such. As temperamental as the sea itself, he watches and controls his domain from deep beneath its surface. During the war, Poseidon favored the Greeks, a seafaring people. But when they set sail for home, arrogant in victory, he unleashed a storm, wreaking havoc on their fleet. Whether it be through gentle breezes or crashing waves, Poseidon, his trident in hand, still speaks to us today, a force as eternal as the tides. From his throne on Mount Olympus, mighty Zeus ruled over God and man alike, maintaining order and justice in the universe. His thunderbolt of vengeance, the most feared weapon on Earth and in the heavens. As combat raged at Troy, other gods picked favorites among the warriors, but Zeus refused to take sides, using his golden scales instead to balance the destinies of Troy's heroes. Yet it was he who bestowed upon Paris the fateful task of judging which goddess was the fairest, and as fate would have it, was also the father of Helen. This god of gods was no paragon of virtue. The most disloyal of husbands, his pursuit of goddesses and mortal women alike, left a trail of deception, heartbreak and violence across the ancient world. From the global celebration of the Olympic Games to the awe-inducing temples and monuments erected in his honor, Zeus's legend remains as strong as the god himself.
Athena, goddess of crafts, the domestic arts, and war. Athena, goddess of war, boasts a combination of divine intellect and extraordinary strength. Her legend claims that she emerged fully grown and clad in armor from the head of Zeus. And of all his children, he chose her to be the bearer of his shield and thunderbolt. A fierce enemy of Troy, she fought alongside the Greek warriors and was said to have grieved over the death of Achilles. But when Troy fell and the Greeks defiled her temple there, Athena sought revenge. She had Poseidon unleash a storm that wreaked havoc on the returning Greek ships. Courageous in war, she also understood the supreme value of peace and was known as the protector of the home and domestic arts. Unlike her fellow goddesses who preferred to call nature home, Athena was devoted to cities. Her favorite was Athens, which bears her name, and where her temple, the Parthenon, still stands as one of the greatest wonders of the world. Hermes was a god forever in motion. In his winged sandals, cadacious in hand, he was best known as the messenger of Zeus and the patron god of travelers. Fittingly, he was also the god of thieves and commerce. It was said that as a child he stole a herd from Apollo, then crafted a lyre from a tortoiseshell as a gift of forgiveness. It was said that he aided Odysseus on his journey home from Troy. And ever since, Hermes has been credited with aiding travelers. Renowned for his physical prowess, he is also known for creating the sport of foot racing, as he was always sprinting around the world on missions for the gods. A bringer of good fortune and wealth, Hermes appears more frequently in mythological tales than any other deity, making him perhaps the most beloved of all the gods on Mount Olympus. Both sister and wife of Zeus, Hera was queen of heaven and a jealous rival of the other goddesses on Mount Olympus. As beautiful as she was shrewd, Hera was thought to be a vigilant guardian of married women, as she knew all too well the bitter sting of infidelity. And though she was demure, she was often vindictive towards those who thwarted her will. Because Paris judged the goddess Aphrodite to be lovelier than she was, she became a fierce enemy of the Trojans, relentlessly using her powers to aid the Greek warriors until Troy lay in ruins. Indeed, Hera's legend gives meaning to the phrase, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. <laughs> 